welcome to the book podcast, talking with Australian women writers of fiction and non-fiction. I'm Rosemary Putty. Hello and welcome to another week of the book podcast. Here in Australia, it's our sixth week in isolation, so I hope you're all keeping safe and well and you found plenty of wonderful books to read. And today, we're going to be talking to Suzanne Leal about her new book, The Deceptions, a compelling story of war, betrayal and family secrets better left buried. Suzanne Leal is the author of The Teacher's Secret and Border Street. A regular interviewer and presenter at literary events and festivals, she was the senior judge for the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards from 2017 to 2019. Suzanne is also a lawyer experienced in child protection, criminal law and refugee law. She lives in Sydney with her husband and four children. Moving from wartime Europe to modern day Australia, The Deceptions is a powerful story of old transgressions, unexpected revelations and the legacy of lives built on lies and deceit. Prague, 1943. Taken from her home in Prague, Hannah Lederova finds herself imprisoned in the Jewish ghetto of Theresienstadt, where she is forced to endure appalling deprivation and the imminent threat of transportation to the east. When she attracts the attention of the Czech gendarme who becomes her guard, Hannah reluctantly accepts his advances hoping for the protection she so desperately needs. Sydney, 2010. Manipulated into a liaison with her married boss, Tessa knows she needs to end it, but how? Tessa's grandmother, Arena, also has something to hide. Harkening back to the Second World War, hers is a carefully kept secret that if revealed, would send shockwaves well beyond her own fractured family. Inspired by a true story of wartime betrayal, The Deceptions is a searing, compassionate tale of love and duplicity, and family secrets better left buried. Suzanne Leal's new novel, The Deceptions, tells the story of wartime betrayal and its long-reaching ramifications, and she's here with me today to talk about it. Hello, Suzanne. Hello, Rosemary. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. And yourself? Good, good. I mean, it's actually a beautiful day for um, another day in the pandemic world, isn't it? (laughs) It is indeed. At least the sun is shining, so that's good. We've had fabulous weather. Well, Suzanne, The Deceptions is your third novel. Like your first novel, Border Street, its inspiration came from the lives of your former landlords, Fred and Eva Perger. So let's go back to the beginning. How and where did you meet them? Oh, thanks for asking me, Rosemary. In the 90s, I'd finished university and my then partner and I were looking to move from the inner west to the beach, which I thought was an, an odd thing to do at the time, but he was really keen. And we went to some open inspections and it was expensive around Bondi where we were looking and we went to an open inspection in Tamarama so for your listeners who may not know that's between Bronte Beach and Bondi Beach from Sydney it's a beautiful area and it was a great place it was a front of a duplex and the only drawback was that the landlords lived at the back of the duplex but I thought it was a beautiful enough spot to um to give that a shot and so what I needed to do then was to make sure that we managed to get the property because there were quite a lot of other people milling around. And at the open inspection, I saw a man at the side of the house where we have been told not to go, who was very tall in his 70s, and he was wearing one of those tennis hats that my dad used to wear. Do you remember those tennis yes. hats with um, Terry Towers? And he had an old business shirt, and I thought and it looked like a gardening shirt, and I thought, there's no way he's come for the inspection. He lives here. So I went to talk to him, and I 
recognised his accent as German, and I speak German, so I spoke to him in German, and he raised an eyebrow when we had a conversation. Within a couple of minutes, he'd gone over to the real estate agent and said, I want this one. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> it turns out, not German, though. He wasn't German, he was Czech, and also Jewish, and also a Holocaust survivor, but he had been um, raised speaking German. A lot of the Jewish Czech population had German as a first language as a result of the Habsburg Empire under the Austrian influence. So we stayed there for six years and Fred and I and Eva and I became very close uh, to the extent that Fred agreed that I could write down his memoirs, particularly his war-related memoirs. So for every week for a year, we wrote or I recorded his memoirs and once the memoirs were finished, I turned really his story into a fiction, a fictional account, and that became my first book, Border Street. And then from there, there was a story that inspired this recent book, The Deception. Mm. Well, let's go a little bit further back into your background. Now, where where was growing up for you? Where was home and where did you go to school? Oh, so I I was born in Queensland in Brisbane. My dad was an academic and he was at the university there. My mother was a teacher. And then I moved to, we all moved to Wollongong, so just south of Sydney. I was seven. And and that's really probably the childhood home for me. I went to school at West Wollongong Public School. And coincidentally, actually, although I didn't know it at the time, the same school that my later husband, now former husband, went to. Oh, funny, isn't it? Yeah. So he was a couple of years older than me, and and neither of us stayed in Wollongong, but that was that was a pivotal point. After that, I went to a high school called Smith's Hill High School, also in Wollongong, and from there I went to university. At university, you studied law, and now you work in child protection, criminal law, and refugee law. So, was to become a lawyer always your chosen career path? Never, ever, ever. So I um I really I really loved languages. I, I speak French and German. My father was a French academic. So what I wanted to do was languages, but I didn't want to teach languages to kids that really didn't want to learn languages. I think at the time that I was coming out of university, languages weren't that popular in schools. So whilst I loved it, I didn't think that teaching it was going to be my um my forte, and now that I've been uh, crisis schooling at home, I know it's not my forte. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but when I when I was at school, I read the university booklet about you know what courses you could do, and there was this course, course called art law, and I liked the sound of it, of art law. And I just liked the rhythm of the words, and it meant you could do languages and something else called law. And when I said that to people, people were very impressed by my choice. So I thought, oh, well, if it's an impressive choice, I probably should um, should give it a shot. And I, and, I, and I did. So I started studying law really to learn languages or to pursue languages. And in the end, there was much of law I didn't like. I, I've never been attracted to the commercial side of law, which is probably <laughs> maybe a mistake in retrospect. But what I do like about law is the story aspects of it. Criminal law is a wealth stories. Uh, Refugee law, which I moved into later, is people's stories. And generally, people who uh, find themselves in difficult times and who need guidance as to what the next step is. So I've always found the plight of people, the individual person, very interesting. And law has been a fascinating career from that perspective. You say you like the rhythm of arts law, the words. So was the idea mm. of writing fiction always in the back of your mind? Always like writing at school. And I had some really excellent teachers. I'm talking about you, Ms. Elwood, who encouraged my writing. But when I went to university, I studied French and German literature. And part of that was to dissect the great writers and to criticise how they wrote and what was happening in the narrative and after a while I thought look if they can't do it right there's no way <laughs> I can even begin to, to, to give it a go so it was really only after uni when I'd finished all that literary criticism that I felt confident enough to give it a shot and, and it sort of began I had um, I had my first baby when I was 29 and I'd 
expected that I might be some sort of genius and that hadn't really um, come to pass. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I better, I better do something, progress my chosen field of, you know, being fabulous mm. at something. And I thought, oh, I'll start writing. And I thought, that's a good idea. I'll have a baby, which means I'll have heaps of time. And oh, then yes. I'll ride <laughs> and then I'll be terrific. <laughs> <laughs> I had the baby. He didn't sleep for a year. But I did manage to get a little bit of time writing. And so it became a practice. And it became almost something that I did in secret because I didn't want to be held to account for it. I didn't want to be judged for it. I just wanted to see if I could do it. I think most authors start like that, though, don't they? And that first draft of any book is really just for yourself. It's not not for anybody else's eyes. I think so. And I think there's so much to learn. I, I think dialogue is hard to learn. I think showing a story rather than telling a story is hard to learn. And, and I think even the discipline of getting... Uh, if you're writing novels or if you're writing a a long work, getting the discipline to actually sit down and get to the end of a book. So I think in those early days, it was even just having the discipline to get to the end that gave me the template for doing it again. To the book now, now much has been written about the Holocaust and it's been the subject of many novels. So were you apprehensive about tackling this difficult subject? I was apprehensive because I needed to know whether I had a place in this writing. I'm not Jewish and I have no relationship to the Holocaust apart from through the stories of my former landlord. So I had to think, first of all, do I have a role in writing about it? And then I had to think there's a whole lot of work in getting a book about the Holocaust historically correct. And I think if yes. you are going to write about the Holocaust, you need to get it right. I must say that sounded like a whole lot of work. The problem was the story that I had was such a, a vivid story in my head and it was a story that had stayed with me for a number of years and wouldn't go away. So in the end, the imperative was more to get the story out of my head more than to consider the nature of it and what the writing would would involve. To the story now, Hannah and Carol are two of the voices that we hear. They're in Europe in 1943 telling their story. And Tessa and Ruth in 2010 in Sydney. Now, as the story starts, we meet Hannah, who is reminiscing about her early life in Prague. Just tell us about this young Hannah and her family. Mm, I really like Hannah. Hannah is a young woman when we meet her. She's about 21, 22. She's the only child of doting parents. Her father is a dentist and her mother assists with the business. Hannah is well-educated. She's cultured. She sings. She plays the piano. She has a fairly charmed life in Prague. She's also Jewish, although this is something that wouldn't have necessarily occurred to her had the Nazis not uh, labelled her as such. And from this charmed life, where there's a housekeeper, where there's a successful business, she and her parents are sent to the ghetto of Theresienstadt, which is a holding camp for Jewish people during the war outside of Prague. And from there, her her journey unfolds. Carol, the other voice, back in 1943, is also thinking back over his life when the book starts. Who was he before the war and what was his life like then? This is an interesting one to research. So Carl, we meet Carl and Hannah together in the Theresienstadt ghetto where Carl has been appointed to be uh, a guard of Hannah's work group, which is a gardening work group. Uh, he's a Czech gendarme. And for someone like Carl, who was born in a rural village in Czechoslovakia and who was born to a farming family, to have been made a Czech gendarme was a source of great pride for him. The gendarmes are an interesting bunch in Czechoslovakia. They're sort of part military and part police, and their job was to keep order within society, but in a way that was of assistance to the population. And they had the most beautiful uniforms, so deep green uniform with high knee-length black leather boots and gold buttons. 
And for Carl, who had lived a fairly narrow life within a farming community, to be a gendarme and to suddenly find himself in this ghetto was quite extraordinary. And I think he probably liked the power of it. Germany, as you say, has entered Czechoslovakia and they start their systematic roundup of all the Jewish people. Now, Hannah and her family are imprisoned in that ghetto. And while they're there, it's a holding place. From there, they get transported to other places. But when Hannah's mother learns that she's going to be transported out of the ghetto and leave Hannah behind, what advice does she give to her daughter? Mm, interesting. What she says to the daughter, her daughter is... If not a beauty, then a very appealing woman. She's charismatic. She's striking. She's young. And she's got beautiful hair, beautiful eyes. And her mother says, I'm not going to be able to protect you. You need to do whatever you can do to save yourself. I don't care what you do. You just do something. And this came from a story that Fred Berger told me of his time in the ghetto. He said, to get through the war... The need for survival topped everything. I mean, there's a need for food and a need for survival. And in the ghetto, you could be placed within the realm of important people or not so important. And the ghetto was run by a group called the Jewish Council of Elders. So within the confines of the ghetto itself, they were alloc- the, the Jewish Council were allocated the responsibility to organise the day-to-day activities. That also included working out who was to be transported. The Nazis would give to the Jewish Council of Elders numbers, the people that were to be transported east, but it was up to the Jewish Council of Elders to choose who that should be. And so you didn't want to be on that list. And people would try whatever they could to save themselves. And often that would involve a sexual relationship or some relationship with someone who was more important than they were. And this, I think, is what Hannah's mother was suggesting she do. A a woman who had always been very mindful of her daughter's modesty and her daughter's innocence and her daughter's youth. Besides that, this comes as a shock for Hannah, who has been quite protected, that her mother, at the crux of this crisis, says, what I've said to you before, you can disregard, you save yourself now. Yeah. Well, as you said, that Carol's job is to look after this gardening detail, which consists of five girls, including Hannah. Look, he's very taken with Hannah, as you said. And from alternating chapters, we see Carol's point of view. And although he takes advantage of Hannah's situation, she's treated with some kindness. But what a moral dilemma for this young girl. Yes. And this is what I wanted to do with this book. I mean, the book's called The Deception, and each of the character has a deception that they're either part of or hiding or embroiled in. And each character has a moral dilemma to consider. Yes, I think for Hannah, the moral dilemma is, do I make myself available to a man I don't love? And the answer in such difficult times is clearly yes. My interest too was from Carol's perspective because I think there was some there was some abuse of power, but there was also some naivety on his behalf. I think he's a more naive and slightly ingenuous character than might seem from the, the circumstances. And for him, it's a love story. He loves her. Um, yes. Yes, he's taken with her right from the beginning. Well, Hannah believes her relationship with Carol will save her from being transported. She doesn't realise that he doesn't have the power to change anything and so she is transported first to Auschwitz and then to Bergen-Belsen. And the girls that work in her detail, they go with her and one of the characters, it's a wonderful character, is Aliska. And Aliska buoys them throughout this whole ordeal. She never loses her dignity despite every deprivation and there are many, many deprivations. She really holds them together. Yes, she's a lovely character. I, and when I say that, I don't mean that there's any weakness in that. I think she's a very strong young woman who has an ability to remain hopeful regardless of the circumstances. Look, in a way, she reminds me of a couple of my friends who I've seen behave with absolute grace, even in, in difficult circumstances, not as difficult as the Holocaust. And I think 
that in describing someone who can bring hope to people around them without making judgments on their behaviour was interesting. So she has an ability to carry the crowd with her. And in one story that I sort of used a little bit from something that Fred had told me, he said that when he went to Auschwitz, there was a group of five of them and they were to share a meal between them. So the meal was plots really that came in one communal bowl and he said everybody just flew upon the bowl like animals and he said we became animals and I took that story and I wanted to work out where do you find some organization when you're treated like animals and there were there was some order in Auschwitz in different areas and that so the story that I, I suppose I started with for Aliska was there are five women and they're starving and this pot comes and four of them fall upon the pot and Aliska stands back. And by the third time this happens, the rest of the women are sharing. So just without passing judgment, without making comment, the model of such grace is contagious, I think. It was a beautiful moment. Oh, thank you. We moved to Sydney in 2010 and we meet Tessa. And Tessa's a young woman. She's a little bit adrift. She's Irene and Carl's granddaughter. So where is she in life when we meet her? So Tessa's early 30s, she's about 32 when we, we meet her. She's working in admin for a large company. She's single. She's well loved by her grandparents and her mother. Uh, her parents divorced when she was perhaps a late teenager and that's always been difficult for her. But when we actually meet her, she started working for one of the bosses of this company where she's employed, a bloke called Evan Hawkins, who's got a strange and slightly nasty charisma. She's also married with two kids. And she finds herself embroiled in an affair with him. It was interesting when I was reading about Tessa, it sort of had completely different circumstances and situations, but echoes from Hannah's relationship with Carol, an an older married man who has children, who pulls them into their sphere. Neither of them really want to be there. Yes, I do find that power dynamic very interesting between particularly a man in power with a woman who has more to lose and more to gain from the relationship. Look, Carol, I have some sympathy for. I think Carol has had a difficult life and has had to make difficult decisions, but it doesn't mean that his relationship with Hannah should be applauded and that it can't be criticised. But I think he's a um, he's a complicated figure. Uh, Evan Hawkins, I mean, we don't see a lot of Evan, but he's um, he was fun to write because he's pretty nasty. I, don't, yes. I, don't, I didn't like him much. But there are those men, and there may be women as well, but I suppose my experience is more with the men, men who are not that nice and not that kind, but somehow feel very physically and sexually appealing. And it's how do you how do you manage the circumstances where you're abhorred by their behaviour but also somehow and almost inexplicably attracted to them. And I suppose for, for Hannah and Carl, it's almost the opposite. I mean, Carl is so taken by this woman who really doesn't like him that much. And if he were to be just a little bit more perceptive, would see that. But I suppose it's, it's how, how we are blinded to situations we want or think we want. The other voice in the story, in the modern story, is that of Ruth, and she's a pastor in Irina's family church who we meet when Irina falls ill. Irina confides in Ruth, and it's here that we learn of the lies and deception at the heart of both families. Now, Leah, when you started thinking about this story, what research did you have to do and how extensive was it? So from the beginning, I had Fred's transcript. So I had his situation during the war and I drew from part of that for Carl, even though they're two different people. I mean, Carl was non-Jewish and and, and Fred was Jewish, but there were aspects of his transcript that I could use for Carl. More importantly, though, was Hannah's story. 
And whilst Eva Perger, my old my former landlady, uh, is in no way Hannah, what I did use from my knowledge of Eva was the geographical journey that Hannah takes. So we meet Hannah at Theresian Jart and as you said, we find her in the end in Belgian Beltsen and on the way, everywhere she goes and everything she does is what happened to Eva. Oh, good girl. And yeah, so it's, and Eva died about 12 years ago now and she was always more reticent about her story and I never wanted to push her with it because she would become very, very upset. But she... Um, made a video for Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation. Steven oh. Spielberg, it's fabulous. I mean, he made available funds for every Holocaust survivor who wanted to to uh, have their memoirs or have their experiences documented. So Fred and Eve both did that. So I had that. I've still got that on video, actually. <laughs> I think his um, daughters have had it made into CDs, but um, I've got it on video and I've got an old video machine that still works. So was quite confronting, even that Eva had been dead for almost 10 years when I started, to see her on the screen again. I, I transcribed that and I used where she went, almost, almost almost to get inside her head, almost to understand what had happened to Eva. Because Fred had always said Eva's experience of the Holocaust was much worse than his. And I wanted to understand how you manage to not only get through that, but go on to live a life that is a very full and in many parts happy life, but with these memories that drag you down at regular intervals. Those were the two main things. Yeah. As you said earlier, you speak fluent French and German and you spoke to German to Fred when you first met him, but did you need any of your language skills for the research? Yes, yes. So apart from... So the memoirs of Fred and, and uh, Eva, there were also a lot of memoirs that other Holocaust survivors have written and uh, some of them went on a similar trajectory to Eva. So I used stories by uh, Zdenka Huntlova and by Olga Horek and, and quite a number of women who had gone through the Holocaust. There's also a really excellent book called Theresienstadt, which was written by H.G. Adler, who was a... Um, Holocaust survivor himself from Theresienstadt and a German scholar, German Jewish scholar. And he wrote this big, big fat book about a thousand pages in German in the 50s. It remained only in German until 2018, I think. And I, I, kept, I was starting to write the book earlier than that. And so I had this book in German, which was tricky. I mean, German, I can read German, but it's, it's a slog, German. <laughs> I think it's all those long words and all that sentence instruction, sort of wading my way through the book and, and just looking at any, anything about gendarmes, anything about the, 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 the uh, ghetto itself, when, to my delight, Belinda Cooper translated the book. It was made available, I think, mid-2018. Oh. So I bought that book. I must say the relief <laughs> of being able to read it in English. So did that tell you a lot that you didn't know about young Czechoslovakian men and their role alongside the Nazis in the war? No, it told me a little bit. I just look up, because the indexing was quite good, so I just look up any reference to gendarmes. So I knew what they wore, what their jobs were. There was a short story written by another Jewish writer who'd been in the ghetto uh, called the Gendarme, and he paints a picture of the dilemma facing this gendarme who will either call him out for a transgression or will protect him. And apart from that, there's, there's a professor, a retired professor now, I think, in the UK called Clive Ambry, and he has written extensively about gendarmes, but mostly European gendarmes. It was a, as I understand it, it was a branch of quasi-military that began during the Napoleonic era. They oh. started in France and then moved to Austria. So and although um, very few people seem to have focused on Czech gendarmes, if any, I used that history to imagine what the background for my gendarme might be. And um, I'm a bit corrected, I can be corrected. <laughs> but um, I, it, it seems to me it would be possible that, or well possible, that someone of Carol's background, which is a rural farming background, might 
seek to move from that area, particularly if he wasn't the oldest son, so wasn't going to inherit the farm, into either something like teaching or something like being a gendarme. Mm. So, uh, so I, I used really the background I had to imagine what would be a possible scenario for Carol. I'd like to find out if you can tell us a little bit about Fred and Eva. Did they meet before they were taken to these death camps or did they meet afterwards? It's an interesting story. They were very young. Fred was, I think, 16 or 17 when they were, when, when the war broke out. He was born in 1923. I mean, he was 16 and Eva was 15. And they were girlfriend and boyfriend when just as the war broke out, and I think even beforehand, and when all the um, measures in Czechoslovakia became tougher. So the schools were stopped, dancing lessons were stopped, um, they couldn't go to the cinema, but they were already in a girlfriend-boyfriend relationship. Eva was sent to Theresienstadt first of all, and then a year or so later, Fred was also sent. And I've got copies of postcards that were sent by Eva's mother, actually, to the grandmother, so from Theresienstadt to Prague, in which she says, and then they, and they have to write them in German because they're all censored, and it says, um, Eva does nothing but think about Fred. So they each went through the Holocaust alone, really, and in the end, Fred was able to locate Eva, who'd been very ill after the Holocaust, through Red Cross. She returned to Prague in, must have been October or November of 45, and she were married in March the next year, and she goes birth to their first child in November that year. It astonished me that a body that had been so mistreated could then produce life and produce their daughter, and then a second daughter. That's actually incredible that they they both went to these camps, they both survived, and they found each other again. That's just that's a wonderful story in itself. Yeah, it's funny. I want, when I was recording the memoirs with Fred, I, I wanted that to be the love story. I wanted that to be the beautiful, non-tragic Romeo and Juliet story of these teenage lovers who uh, had fought the odds and then returned home to be reunited. But I mean, Fred was a very honest man, and he and Eva had a very good relationship. It was a very loving relationship. But I think also what I had, what I learnt, or what I came to glean, was that it's a big responsibility for two teenagers to find a partner at that age to go through such horror mm. and to come back. I mean, he said there was no, of course we we're going to marry. I mean, you've been through this. What would you do? But I. My boys are now late teenagers and and in their early 20s. And I think it's an enormous responsibility for a young man to make a decision about their future in such circumstances. And it gave me, I suppose, more admiration for the way in which they manage their life. Because, you know, once for the Czechs, once the war finished, then there was communism to deal with. And, And Fred came from a wealthy family. So was another 20 years of, of being designated as the outsider. And how did they find their way to Australia? It was after the um, Prague Spring, so it was in um, 1968. And Fred had had the op- Fred's father had had the option to leave Czechoslovakia in the 20s and hadn't. And then Fred had had the option to leave Czechoslovakia in the four- so after the war in 45, but he said... He used to be very gay to himself. He said he was too busy partying and spending money to, to, to think about, to think sensibly. And I think what that, as I got older, what that translates as is that to get through the trauma, how do you make such another life-changing decision? Mm. Anyway, so there were two decisions that, I mean, he, he thought his father should have made the decision. He regretted the decision not leaving in 46. So... After and and he he railed under communism. He remember him telling me once that and they lived very close to the Austrian border, and or at least that they had holidays close to the Austrian border. And he said he'd look up at the clouds and say the clouds are drifting across the border, but I can't, and it's so frustrating. So in '68, when the Russian rule of um, Czechoslovakia was relenting during that Prague Spring. 
He and Eva took their daughter, their son-in-law, their second daughter, Renata, and their young grandson. They fled over the border to Austria, or they tried to. They were sent back and then tried again two days later, got through. And from there, Fred had a contact in Australia who offered him a job working in a sausage casing small goods factory. And he was a mathematician, Fred. And he stayed there for many years and was absolutely grateful, I think every day of his life, for being able to make a, um, a living and he made a good living in, in Australia. It's an incredible story, isn't it? The just sheer stoicness of these people and, and how they've conducted their lives since is it's just wonderful. Eva learnt to drive at the age of 44. They were 43 or 44 when they arrived in Australia. And times in my life when I've had to start a game, so I had a marriage, not work when I was younger. But whenever I thought, gosh, how can I start a game at my age or in my circumstances or at this point, I always think of them and I always think, you know what, they came to Australia with nothing, nothing when they were in their mid-40s. And Fred had English, Eva had some English, but um, they to learn it. They had qualifications that weren't recognised. And I thought, if they can do it, then I can maybe just shut up and give it a shot. That's so true. With your legal background, Suzanne, and your work with refugees, do you think that's influenced you at all as a writer? I think always. I think that in the jobs that I've had, I have been able to hear stories that many people would not want to give to someone else or wouldn't be in a position to. So just to explain that, in my job at the Refugee Review Tribunal, I was a member of the tribunal, which meant that it would come before me to explain why they met the definition of a refugee and why they should be granted a protection visa. And of course, this meant, and it meant that I had to question, it's an inquisitorial process, so it was my job to question, see whether they satisfied the criteria. And obviously you get people that are talking about deeply traumatic events that they haven't told many people, if any people, and now they have to tell it to a stranger, which was me. And I think the stories that I was given just opened my eyes to what can happen and what people can survive, where resilience is, and also where the truth may or may not be. So, And that's also for, for criminal law and also in the area of child protection where I work now. And I think questioning what happens, how it happens, what I would have done in these circumstances are questions that work well in writing. So many of the questions that come to me in my legal work that I don't necessarily have to answer because you have a specific legal question to answer stay in my head. So the nature of truth, is truth what we should aspire to all the time? Or are there reasons that people lie? All those questions that bubble inside you but don't have an outlet in my legal work, I found an outlet for in fiction. And it's those questions that keep me writing because they're questions that are long and hard. You don't tire of because they're fundamental questions. And I yeah. think, if anything, that's, that's what I look to. I look to what is truth? Um, what can we believe? How do we believe it? Where do we find resilience? Where do we find hope? How to manage? How do people manage crises? So I think that that directly comes back from my experiences in the law. You're also on the board of the Sydney Crime Writers Festival, and you were a senior judge on the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards. So obviously, you get to read some wonderful literature. But what else did those positions entail? Look, both positions have been terrific. So the first one, I've been involved with the New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards for some time, not now, but I finished my tenure as senior judge last year. Initially, I, I was on the panel for the Fiction Award, Fema Stead Award, and that involved three of us, and we would consider all the entries. Um, there were two prizes, one for the overall winner and one for a first work. You have to look at literary merit, and you have to see which book deserved to win and which book deserve to be on the short list and for me I've always felt most successful to get a really good short list. Once my panel members and I agree on a short list I feel not quite done but almost because I think what's really interesting is to watch get from 150 books down to six 
and feel very happy with those six. And I think what's most surprised and buoyed me, particularly in the early days of judging, was how much stuff was being written. People are writing a lot. People, and it, it's not for money because, as most people know, I think the average wage for a writer is eleven thousand dollars a year in Australia. <laughs> yes. So, the, the, so I mean, it, it's not going to get you get you much. But um, the imperative to write and the imperative to be creative can't be quelled even when the finances aren't there. And, and I think as as a senior judge, as a senior judge was a, an overseeing job where I oversaw pan, ten or eleven panels of the competition. And what I loved about that is getting access to what scripts. Were, were were being written, what what screenplays, what poetry, what people were writing for children and young people, what our Indigenous authors were doing, uh, what multicultural works were being written, as well as the fiction and non-fiction. And I think what it gave me is a um, a really great overview of the Australian literary world and how it was progressing. I know myself just from doing the podcast, the wealth of talent that we have out there. I only talk to Australian women writers, but they're just incredible at the moment. It, and it just seems to be a whole rush of really, really good writing over the past two or three years. And you know what else there's been? I mean, I, I've been on this bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival board for a few couple of years now. The great crime that's out there. I'm yes. not, uh, crime's not been my natural genre. But since I've been on the board, I've been fascinated by the way people write about crime in the different areas and how how engaging it is. It truly is. Yes, there's some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful crime books out there. Now, this might be a hard question for you to answer, but what's the best book that you've read in the past year? Okay, the best book I've written read in the past year that's a very that is a hard one but there's some <laughs> terrific ones you know what it's read and i did it by audiobook i do a lot by audiobook because i run rose tremaine the gustav sonata it's not a new book no uh, it's not an australian book it's a, it's a story of a friendship really between two boys post-war and set in switzerland and she has the most magnificent turn of phrase I think the other book that I would go back to again is A Boy in Winter by Rachel Seaford, who's an, who's an English but also Australian author. Mm. And that's again a wartime story which is set in the Ukraine. And she has a fast but emotionally rich style of writing. Her um, first book, The Dark Room, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize when she was you know, five or something, or 23 <laughs> or something. <laughs> So that, but in terms of Australian work, I've been enjoying Derva McKinnon. Oh yes, yeah, uh, she's Baron lovely. And the scholar, I haven't read. I haven't read the, the Good Turn yet. I'm, I'm really engaged in her work. As a writer, though, when you're and because you've been a judge on on literary awards and you're and the Writers Festival, as a writer, when you're reading a book, do you? break it down? I mean, do, do you annotate it? You know, you find a fabulous phrase or, or a beautiful piece of prose. Are you taken away with that or are you just taken away with the story? I think what's interesting about judging is that when I first did it, I was so excited to get all these books. I just thought, <laughs> this is fantastic. I'm just going to read all these books. I'm so lucky. The problem is you don't have time to take your time because there are so many books to read and the time limits are pretty rigorous so I've learnt to read to cull when I judge which is different when I read I read differently given the task that I have yeah when I read to interview um, and you might be the same as me I read looking for questions that are interesting mm. and how to engage the author I know I'm going to be interviewing when I read to review I'm I'm looking for something constructive to say about the book. It might not be a book that I love, but what I like to do is to think of how I can be constructive in a review that's going to be presented to readers. And when I judge, I look to cull. So those first 50 pages are very important. And the book needs to be well-written. It needs to have a cohesive narrative. It needs to to dance, I think, really. And by 50 pages, it needs to have captured me. So I think that's how I do the judging. 
Well, it's a strange time. Your book's just been released. It's a strange time to release a book. Normally, there would be book tours and talks and all sorts of promotion. So how have you been coping with all of that? And have you got any promotional tips to authors in the same position? Yes. Yes, it was probably not a time I would have chosen, although I have found it quite a challenge to adapt to what's become um, a very, a much more online-focused promotion and discussion Hmm. and this is something that I needed to have done for a long time I think which is to engage more in a the online community which is really vibrant and really innovative so I suppose when I realized everything was collapsing I thought well this is my one chance books take generally a long time to write it's difficult to get published difficult to get people behind you and I thought I've got Alan and I'm on publishing a book. I've got them behind me. I have an excellent publicist, excellent marketing team. I need to do what I can to make the book fly. And so rather than, it was almost no time to be too disappointed. You know, obviously having other festivals fall over was disappointing. And I think most disappointing because I'd been invited to a couple of Jewish festivals, so the Melbourne Jewish Book Week and also in discussions with some other other festivals. And I had felt so honoured and I felt so pleased to be embraced by the Jewish community for this book, which was about what had happened to their community, not mine. And I think that's what's been most disappointing, although I have since kept up my connections with, with the parts of the, the literary community amongst Jewish writers in Australia. What I think for tips for people in a similar situation is rather than getting really down about it, the chances of becoming a millionaire through your book are minimal. So it's not necessarily going to be the enormous financial boom you might hope, but what you need is to be out there talking and being recognised. So for me, I engaged a social media consultant and that might not be an option for everybody but I I use some of the advance towards that and through her I've updated my website I've started a newsletter so a weekly newsletter and I do an online book club which is called Thursday Book Club in which I talk a little bit about my work about books that I've been reading about literary events so we've had the Vogel Prize recently and next this week or later on this week we'll have the New South Wales Premier Literary Awards and then open it up to, to guests or at least people who are attend, attending the book club for their recommendations. And what I've le- learned is that people like to engage with you. People like to know their writer. People like to know the person behind the book. And I'd always been a bit reticent with that, partly because my job as a lawyer, it's been the opposite. So you keep yourself quite private in order to maintain an impartiality in the work, the work you do. But on the flip side, as a writer... What I'm learning is that people want to know you and people want to talk to you and people want to engage. And now that so much is online, that's possible. So so what I would say to all writers with their books out is take heart. People are reading. People are at home and they're looking for books to read. It might be yours. Be enthusiastic about interviews that you're invited to. Don't be too nervous about the technology. If If I can juggle my way through it, you can. Don't be reticent about promoting your book because this is your business and people expect businesses to be promoted. So where can people find you, Suzanne? So people can find me through my website, which is Suzanne Leal, on Facebook. I've also got a Facebook author page. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram. So I'd love to um, connect with you out there. And I'll put all of those details up on my website. So what's next for your writing? So I'm in the middle of another novel. Um, I've been told by my agent not to talk about it too much because she says, Suzanne, mm-hmm. you'll, just, you'll just take all the energy out of it. <laughs> so I'm, um, <laughs> Fair it's, enough. So it's, look, it's, it's following on this theme, which I think I do almost without being too conscious of it, but I, I think I'm interested in people placed into difficult situations and how they work through them. So what resilience they have, what hope they bring to a situation that may be difficult. The book, I've just finished the first draft. I'm working on the second draft. It's a a woman who finds herself in difficult times and how she navigates her way through. First person, just one person this time. And I think it's working. So that'll be published, what, next year? um, I'm I'm trying to work work hard. (laughs) Next time, fingers crossed. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes, it takes a few drafts, doesn't it? It's not just the first draft. No, although the first draft, once, once I've got the first draft out, I breathe a sigh of relief. The first draft is always more difficult than anything else, to me at least. Well, The Deceptions is a compelling story of war, betrayal and family secrets better left buried. And as Nikki Jemmel says on the cover of this book, it's mesmerising, heartbreaking and honest. It's ferociously good. Suzanne, I want to thank you for talking to me today on the book podcast and I wish you every success with The Deceptions. Oh, thank you, Rosemary, and thank you so much for the work that you're doing amongst Australian women writers. It's, it's terrific to, to have you doing so well. That was Susan Leal talking about her book, The Deceptions. The Deceptions is published by Alan and Unwin. And the music today is by Vortex. It's called Hope from the album Peaceful Mind. Next week, I talk to Sophie Hardcastle about her book, Below Deck. Below Deck is the highly anticipated debut novel, a heartbreakingly poetic and haunting story about the vagaries of consent about who has the space to speak and who is believed. 21-year-old Olivia hears the world in colour, but her life is mottled grey. Estranged from her parents and living with her grandfather who is drowning in sadness, Ollie faces the reality of life beyond university alone. When she wakes on a boat with no recollection of how she got there, she accepts the help of two strangers who change the course of her future forever. With Mac and Maggie, Ollie learns to navigate a life upon open ocean and the world flowers into colours she's never seen before. Four years later, Ollie, fluent in the language of the sea, is the only woman among men on a yacht delivery from Noumea to Auckland. In the darkness, below deck, she learns that at sea, no one can hear you scream. Moving to London, Ollie's life at sea is buried. When she meets Hugo, the wind changes and her memories are dust blown into shapes, reminding her of everything. Below Deck is about the moments that haunt us, the moments that fan out like ripples through the deep, so that everything else becomes everything after. And that's next week on the book podcast. I hope you can join me. You've been listening to the book podcast. Details of this programme can be found on our website, thebookpodcast.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, it's free, and please, while you're there, leave a review, it'd really help. You can follow us via Facebook and Twitter at The Book Podcast. I'm Rosemary Puddy. I hope you've enjoyed the programme. Thank you for listening. Listening.